Today we're going to talk about linear solvers. So last time we left off talking about looking at this motivating example of this fire um, that occurred in Maryland and where the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a potential um, uh, hiring place for you all as chemical engineers, they did a simulation to understand what happened in that fire. Now, what does that have to do with linear systems? We kind of rushed off at the end. Um, and you remember, if you remember this contour plot that showed the heated air um, as it was moving around in the fire and coming out from the basement and going through the door, the color um, designates, in this case, the velocity, as shown on the right. But it's also can be tagged with temperature and other things. Now, what does that have to do with linear systems of equations? It has a lot to do with linear systems of equations. The foundation of all of these simulations is systems of linear equations, and we are going to do a problem just like that. In one dimension, though, but we're going to do a problem just like that by the end of this topic on linear solvers, okay? The way we do it, very roughly, is we take the calculation domain, the region could be the house, could be the, your pipe flow, could be an engine, just the region that we are interested in calculating something in, and we create what is called a discrete grid. Why? Because in numerical methods, we're, we cannot do things continuously. We have to do things discreetly. So we chop off this region in space into small chunks that we call them grid cells. Each one of those squares is a grid cell. Okay? And we put a point in the middle of each grid cell. And then we assign an unknown value for the temperature, for the velocity, for enthalpy, for the pressure, whatever you, whatever you want to calculate. Then we take the full continuous equations, the partial differential equations that have partial derivatives in them, and we take those derivatives and approximate them with the Taylor series at each and every point. And then what happens, you end up with algebraic relations between all the unknown variables. Those are linear equations. So you end up with a system of linear equations relating all the unknowns everywhere. The velocity, the temperature, the pressure. You solve them all with the methods that we're going to learn in this, in this chapter. And then you obtain a profile for the temperature or the velocity. Okay? But before we get there, there's some groundwork we need to do. We're going to start, start with learning objectives. I really like learning objectives because they help me plan the course and they help you understand by the end of, the, of a chapter, excuse me, whether you met those learning objectives. And they're also helpful for exams and as study guides. I sent you a graded survey today um, asking you two questions anonymously. Please fill out that survey. One of them is, what didn't you understand from the learning objectives? Is there something that was stuck that you didn't get from the error um, analysis chapter? And what would you do differently if you're teaching this class, if you're teaching the topic on errors, right? Ta feedback is anonymous, so be as genuine and as candid as, as you can. By the end, before exam one, we're going to summarize all of those questions, and we'll, I'll answer them all here with you. So you'll have also a detailed study guide for the exam as well. Um, but remember the learning objectives when you go and try to answer that survey. All right, so let's go through them. Um, you're going to learn to define a linear equation, distinguish between nonlinear linear and nonlinear equations, identify a linear system of equations, and then write it in matrix form. It's going to be very important to write things in matrix form. And you will learn now to see matrices as just systems of linear equations and nothing else. Um, identify rows and columns in a matrix. So if I tell you, um, you know, 
element A35 in a matrix. What row, what column does that belong to? I always get that confused. Identify different types of common matrices that we encounter in engineering, dense, sparse, triangular, diagonal, tridiagonal. Define the word matrix sparsity. Define the objectives of linear solvers. Why do we need linear solvers? Define two general approaches for solving linear systems of equations, direct and iterative methods. In th this year, we're only gonna focus on direct methods. Classify a linear system of equations and identify which solution methodology is appropriate. Um, it's really easy. Then use a special algorithm called the TDMA or the tridiagonal matrix algorithm, a very, very, very efficient and fast linear solver for a certain class of problems that you encounter in chemical engineering, heat transfer, mass transfer, diffusion processes, okay? Um, and you will see the need why we need special solvers. We're going to get there where we'll show that the cost of using these linear solvers is going to explode um, very quickly, exponentially. Learn how to build tridiagonal matrices in Python. Use the TD a TDMA Python code to solve tridiagonal systems. And finally, use this Python code to solve the temperature distribution in a 1D piece of material that is heated in the middle. Okay? The items in red here, we were not going to cover this year, but I just put them there in case we touch upon them or in case you're interested. So we start by asking the question, what is a linear equation? And I find it best to just learn by looking at examples. A linear equation is one where the unknowns, or we call them variables, show up in a linear fashion. And that's still, it's kind of a tautological answer. A linear equation is one where the unknowns show up linearly. What that means is that the unknowns are neither squared nor under any transcendental function like a sine or cosine or any of that. Okay? So for example here, square root of 2 times x plus 3, x is the unknown and that shows up linearly. a y plus c, if y is your unknown, then it shows up linearly. a might be your unknown, as we will see in regression. Um, then A shows up linearly. 2U equal 5, U shows up linearly. It's not squared. It's not under any transcendental function. So it's a linear equation. Compare that to nonlinear equations where you see the unknowns showing up under, they're either squared um, or under transcendental functions like the square root of Y or the logarithm of U. Okay? Very simply. All right. Now, you've seen these equations um, and you've also probably seen systems of linear equations when you have many linear equations that are connected to each other. Um, you're solving for two variables, x and y, and you end up with two equations that are each, each of those equations is linear. Then you have a system of linear equations. Okay, no mystery there. Um, why are they important? Because they show up in engineering and in science. In, in computational fluid dynamics, my group's research area, they're everywhere. We have to solve a large system of equations for the pressure. I'm talking about 100 million equations by 100 million unknowns. That's the level of equations we're talking about. For the velocity field, it's, equal, it's even harder. It's even more complicated because there are three components of the velocity, u, v, and w, in the three directions. Okay? In data analysis, including curve fitting, as you will see later, you're gonna, and regression analysis, you're going to need to solve system of systems of equations um, both linear and nonlinear, to do the curve fitting and your regression, to find the coefficients okay, for the regression. Now, one classic example um, that I want to start the discussion with so we can work out through some examples by hand. Um, and the way I'm going to approach this is we're just going to learn how to drive immediately. Okay? We're just going to learn how to solve systems of equations in Python so, so that you can see that, oh, yeah, I can do this. And... We just know how to do it, and then we're going to open the hood and see what's inside, okay? But first, I need to talk about an important principle in uh, engineering, which is conservation. Cons we always talk about conservation of mass, conservation of ma energy, conservation of momentum, etc. cetera. Um, those are the fun fun fundamental conservation laws for, for engineering. And specifically in chemical engineering, you will learn as you design reactors and pipe systems and things like that, that conservation of mass is critical, okay? So you have a bucket, okay, and there's a hole in the bucket, and you dump water in the bucket, and the hole is emptying the bucket. So there's going to be, if the rate at which you're putting water in the bucket is higher than the rate at which it's exiting, you're going to have a leftover level in the bucket, right? Or if as much water 
first coming in, as much of it is leaving, then you're going to have what's called a steady state, right? So we understand that intuitively, but mathematically speaking, the idea of conservation of mass says, if you have a volume, think of this as your bucket, and you're bringing in things into the bucket, and you're taking things out of the bucket, depending on the rate at which things are coming in and things are leaving, there might be some accumulation, some leftover material in the bucket. And we state that principle by saying the accumulation, the net material that's left in this bucket, is equal to all the inputs minus all the outputs. Okay? So again, think of a bucket with a hole in it. You're filling it with water. If the hole is dumping water faster than you're bringing in, then you're not going to accumulate anything. If the hole is dumping water at a slower rate, then you're going to accumulate some stuff. If they're equal, then whatever is coming in is leaving. Exactly. Okay? Now... Steady state occurs, which is just this example that I said, where whatever is coming in is exactly leaving out of the system, then there's no accumulation. Nothing is being accumulated. In that case, accumulation is zero, and therefore the previous equation tells you that inputs are equal to your outputs. Well, this is an example of your bucket. You're bringing in some material um, at a given, we call it volumetric flow rate, um, which is volume per um, uh, volume per second, like um, uh, meters cubed per second, for example, or meters cubed per minute, right? And you're bringing in some concentration. I'm not talking to you, Siri. Let me, let me silence her. Um, you're bringing in some concentration um, of material. So that could be grams or kilograms per cubic meter. Then you can use this idea of inputs equal outputs to find the balance, to find the relation between Q1 and concentration 1, Q2 and C2, and Q3 and C3. This is just an example. Okay? All right. So let's see how this works more specifically. If you know the volumetric flow rate, um, shown here, that's, that's volume per second, and the concentration of a certain compound or the density or some property of the compound that is conserved, then this inputs equal outputs tells you that concentration of stream one times the volume flow rate of stream one plus the concentration of stream two times the volume flow rate of stream two is equal to the concentration of stream three times the volume flow rate of stream three. Right now the units of concentration times the volume flow rate is going to be mass per second, right? So you have kilograms per second times meters cube, uh, uh, sorry, kilograms per meter cube times meter cube per second, so you get mass per second, okay? How much mass is being, is flowing through the system per second? Okay, let's do an example. Here's a um, system, <laughs> a reacting system, um, or a non-reacting system, actually, um, with some flow coming in into bucket one or um, container one, Okay, now this flow that is coming in is coming at um, 5 meters cubed per second, and it has an initial concentration of 10 kilograms per meter cube. Okay, and then it's coming into this container that, has, that changes the concentration. It dilutes it, okay, because of its size, etc. It changes its properties, but it's still conserved. Now from C1, okay, so if you look at C1, there's something coming in into C1, but also there's something leaving at a rate of Q3 and something coming in at the rate Q4. Now what's leaving from um, C1 at Q3 is going to carry concentration C1 times Q3 into C3. And whatever is coming in into C1 carries concentration C2 times Q4, right? So whatever is coming here. So now individually, each of those buckets is going to satisfy inputs equal outputs formula. Okay? Now, I, what I want you to do is derive the equations that govern this system. We're going to assume that we know the, uh, the flow rates, um, so Q5 equal 2 up there. We're going to assume that we know these volumetric flow rates, but we don't know the concentrations. So your question, the question that we're going to ask you is, find the concentrations in these different buckets. It's easier to measure flow rate because you just put a flow meter. It's just how much mass is passing, okay? How much mass is passing through the pipe, all right? So I'll give you the first bucket. So for bucket one, inputs equal outputs. What are the inputs? It's C01 times Q1. That's an input. What's another input? It's Q4 times C2, right? 
because Q4 is going to carry C2 with it and bring it into C1. It's going to carry that much concentration. And then what, have, what is leaving, what is the output out of C1? It's C1 times Q3. Okay, so now do it for bucket two and bucket three. Whatever is inputs equal outputs, okay? And leave it in symbolic form. So go to bucket two. Whatever is coming in is equal to whatever is leaving. The flow rate always multiplies the, the volumetric flow rate, multiplies the concentration. Do it symbolically. Inputs equal outputs. like 10% battery. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you have a charger? Mm -hmm. Can he borrow it? Yep. Yeah. So Nicholas will lend you his charger. Okay. But don't forget to give it back. So I think, yeah, you can just charge to the USB-C. Thank you, Nicholas. We owe you a coffee or something. <laughs> All right, there you go. Okay, how are we doing? <laughs> All right, I'd love to have your um, name tags, please. I'm name tags in front of you, and I, I don't see any group names this year, so um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember, but probably. <laughs> do you do anything wrong? <laughs> it uh, blocks the light. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Who wants to take uh, bucket number two? C is concentration. It's mass per unit volume. Okay. So who wants to take bucket two? Not from the front. You guys, I always lean on you. So we got to give a chance for, uh, for those in the back. Okay. In the third row and up. Okay. Who would like to take bucket two? Anyone would like to take bucket number two? Go ahead. Okay. So Q2 times C3, that's the input. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, equal to? C2 times Q4 and C2 plus C2. Plus C2 times Q6. Yeah. Q6. Agreed. Okay, great. Who wants to take bucket three? Right? It would be C1 times Q3. So bucket three, we're going to have, yes, C1 times Q3 equal? Minus or equal to mm -hmm. uh, C3 times C5 plus C3 times C5. Excellent. I agree. Okay, great. So it's clear now that, or if it wasn't clear, let me clarify again. Our objective is to find those three concentrations, C1, C2, and C3. How much concentration do we have in those buckets, given only the knowledge of the flow rates? Okay. So we wrote three equations okay, with three unknowns. right? So sanity check tells us a basic idea in math is that if you have as many equations as you have knowns, then your system is well posed, supposedly, and you can solve it. Indeed, we can solve this. And now the, as a, the second question, if we substitute the numbers, this is what we get. I'm not changing the equations. I'm keeping everything inputs equal outputs. Now, anyone disagrees that this is a system, this is not a system of linear equations? It is a system of linear equations, right? All the unknowns, C1, C2, and C3, they show up linearly, and it's a system. Now, you can solve this by hand, of course, right? But we're going to show you how to do it with Python because the systems you're going to be dealing with are going to be hundreds and hundreds of, equ of equations, okay? But this is a good, um, for, a good for illustration purposes. The next step, if you've done linear algebra, you know how to do this. If you're just taking linear algebra, 
Okay, the next step is to take this system and make it more uh, mathematically digestible. We want to deal with something that is a little bit more abstract. Okay, because right now you have like C1 and C2 on the left and C2 and like can't really make sense of all of it. Okay. It's frankly, when I look at systems of equations like this, I'm like, oh, they look ugly, okay? I want a nicer form to look at them. The first step is to rearrange things by moving everything that contains unknowns to the left-hand side, and everything that you know, the numbers, essentially 50 and 0 and 0, I guess, on the other ones, to the right-hand side. So. First step is to move all the things that contain unknowns to the left-hand side and everything else to the right-hand side. So the first equation, we write 3C1 minus 1.5C2 equal 50. Second equation, 4.5C2 minus 1.3C3 equal 0. And third one, minus 3C1 plus 3.3C3 equals 0. Okay? Now notice I put them in order. Okay? This makes sense, C1, C2, C3. I put them in order. These are still the same system of equations. Now, what is the next step? I want to write, yes. Oh, yeah, what is the next step? Correct, yeah, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's, that's right. And I should have done that to clarify the, um, actually would have sounded better, would have looked better, actually. Maybe I'll do that for uh, after, after, after the class. But my next step is I want to convert this into matrix form. Okay? And we'll see the benefits of writing things in a matrix form. But first, here's how I would do it. I have three unknowns. Each equation, okay, I want to introduce that unknown in each equation. The first equation has C1 and C2 but doesn't have C3. Right? What that means, it has 0 times C3. So exactly what you were saying. Okay? The second equation doesn't have C1, which means it has 0 times C1, right? It's the same thing, doesn't change a thing. And the third equation doesn't have C2, it's like it has 0 times C2, okay? So now, I want you to see that this form that I've written here is consistent with the equations up there. 3C1 minus 1.5C2 plus 0C3 equal 50, right? That's the first equation. The second equation is 0C1 plus 4.5C2 Minus 1.33 equals 0. That's the second equation. And this is the third equation. Minus 3C1 plus 0C2 plus 3.3C3 equals 0. Okay, this is kind of one step towards matrix form. Now, I want to convert this into matrix form. This is what it looks like. Now, matrix vector multiplication is straightforward once you know how to do it. But... The first step to think about here is, what are my unknowns? My unknowns are C1, C2, C3. Go ahead and put them in a column vector. Those are your unknowns. C1, C2, C3. On the right-hand side, you already have your right-hand side vector. 50, 0, 0. Okay? Now, the coefficient matrix is going to collect all the coefficients that are going to multiply C1, C2, C3. Now, if you look at the equation above, the first row contains the first row in those vectors that I wrote. So the way you read this is you take this row to obtain the first equation. You take the first row and multiply it by the unknowns, and that's equal to the first entry here. So do it. So it's a dot product, 3 times C1 minus 1.5 times C2 plus 0 times C3 equal 50. I'm probably repeating the obvious, but some of you are just seeing this right now. The second equation starts with the second row. You do the dot product between this vector and this vector. So it's 0 times C1 plus 4.5 C2 minus 1.33 equals 0. And same for the third equation. Okay? You should master this. Because you're going to, in homework and exams, you're going to derive a set of equations. You're going to have to write in matrix form. And then you're going to be dealing with the matrix. Okay? So we call this the coefficient matrix, the solution vector, and we call whatever on the right-hand side, we call it the right-hand side vector. Okay? We're going to agree on this nomenclature. Okay? We're going to agree on this nomenclature. Coefficient matrix, solution vector, right-hand side vector. 
The solution vector, sometimes I might call it uh, Q or T, if I'm referring to temperature, but I, it's always the solution vector. It's funny because it contains the unknowns, right? It doesn't contain the solution, but once we solve for it, it's going to fill those unknowns with values, right? Which are going to be our solution, okay? All right, AX equal B, right? So look where we started, ugly set of equations. And now we just have three symbols, A, X equal B. I love it, right? Because now we know that our objective is to find X. So how do we find X? If you were to solve a single algebraic equation, like 2X equal 3, then you'd say X equal 3 over 2, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's, stick, uh, let's, let's stick with what we're doing here. So if you take the analogy with a linear equation, technically that's what you're doing. You're taking x equal b over a, okay? However, there's a problem with this because you cannot divide by a matrix. Matrix division doesn't make sense. What do you do? You divide by each element. It's a vector dividing, divided by a matrix, but the matrix is a size m by m, and the vector is m by 1. It doesn't make sense, right? So matrix division doesn't exist in math. The equivalent of matrix division is called the matrix inverse. That's what it is. It's the equivalent of 1 over A. It's the operation that divides B by A. We just call it the matrix inverse. So when you learn about matrix inverse in linear algebra, Think about this lecture and the single equation AX equal B, then X equal B over A, but 1 over A is not defined for matrices. We just call it the inverse. And technically, that's correct because 1 over A is the inverse of A, right? It's A to the power minus 1. For matrices, we use this notation. Okay. You've seen this, perhaps, um, or you're doing this right now. So no, nothing new over here. Okay. Now, the purpose of linear solvers, which is where we're going to depart from um, classic mathematics and applied math, is for all practical purposes in our engineering profession and science profession, our objective is given a linear system of equations, our objective is to use a linear solver to either find the inverse of A, because we agree that if we find the inverse of A, we can find the solution. Right? X equal A inverse times B. We simply multiply the inverse by B, by the right-hand side vector. Or find an approximation to the inverse of A. Yeah. Finding A inverse is very expensive. Once you hit systems of equations that are, you know, 100 by 100 or like 1,000 or 10,000, spend a century finding the inverse. So we don't find the inverse. We find an approximation to the inverse. There's thousands of research and theories on how to find approximations to the inverse. Luckily, we're not going to learn any of that. We're just going to learn the results of all of those theories, OK? Or there are ways to actually solve the system without even computing the inverse. Those are what we call iterative methods, OK? We'll discuss those very briefly. We're not going to spend any time on them. but. That's the idea. The purpose of linear solvers, if I ask you what's the purpose of linear solvers, is to either find the inverse of the coefficient matrix in a system of equations, or find an approximation to that inverse, or solve the system without even finding the inverse of A. Because it all goes back to this x equal A inverse B. All right, we're going to do the brute force approach right now. And you're probably familiar with Gaussian elimination in high school, right? You had a system of equations. You go and just go step by step. You're technically finding the inverse of the matrix implicitly right, to find the solution. Okay? And we're going to use that method as our standard method to solving systems of equations because, for the most part, you are going to be dealing with, this, with systems that are small enough where a method like Gaussian elimination is sufficient. No need to have worry about anything else, OK? So we're going to use built-in Python solvers. No, you're not going to implement Gaussian elimination or anything like that. We're just going to use two built-in routines in Python, because our focus is to solve 
the systems of equations, to do, to do the physics. Remember, this is not a class on mathematics or the theory of numerical methods. This is a class on using numerical methods to solve problems that are relevant. Sometimes we need to dig a little bit into the theory okay, to satisfy our um, curiosity, but that's not the purpose. Okay? And if I derail, please remind me, all right? because I tend to like the theory. All right. So next step is we're going to do um, what I call Pythonification. I, I promise I coined that term. It exists on the internet, but I, I probably was among the first to coin that term about uh, Pythonification. So the idea of taking whatever we learned and putting it in Python, OK? Um, and there's another definition that, you know, where you Pythonify everything in life, like um, our friend Josh here, you know, who you know, was sitting for dinner and he's like importing dishes from the kitchen and his mom says, hey, stop Pythonifying dinner. So anyway, take that however you like, but we're gonna Pythonify our math equations, all right? There are two popular routines that we are gonna use to solve simple systems of equations, small, small systems of equations. The first one, both of them come from the NumPy linear algebra library. Are there other libraries in Python that do linear solvers? Absolutely. Yes, there's plenty. And you can pursue those on your own. The standard ones, the most popular, the simplest ones are, come from numpy.linearalgebra. Okay? The first one is called solve. It's called from numpy.linalg.solve, and it takes the following two arguments, A and B. Guess what A is? Coefficient, coefficient matrix, right? And B is the right-hand side vector. Okay? So this is how you use it. From numpy.lin algebra, import solve. You create A and B. We're going to discuss that in two slides. Suppose, though, you have A and you have B. Then you say solve A, B. That's going to return the solution vector. So X equals solve A, B. It's like saying x equal or solution equal a inverse b, okay? Internally, Python does its thing, takes the coefficient matrix, takes the right-hand side, does the inverse, and returns a solution. You store it in the vector a, okay? And you print it, okay? The other one is to go directly after the inverse. Say for some reason you want to, ha to know the inverse. Because perhaps your coefficient matrix is not changing ever. However, your right-hand sign vector keeps changing. You're changing the feed rate of your reactor, and you have to kind of repeat the calculations one million times. Then you compute the inverse once, because the coefficient matrix is not changing, and you just apply it over and over again to the new right-hand side vector. Okay? So there's some use cases where a matrix inverse is useful, okay? knowing the matrix inverse. And this is how you do it. Also, from NumPy, in algebra, you import inverse, INV. And then you know A, you know B. We'll learn how to do that in the next couple slides. Then you just simply call inverse A. And that returns a matrix of the same size of A, whose entries are the inverse of A. So A inverse is equal to inverse A. Now, to obtain the solution, you need to multiply A inverse by that right-hand side vector. Ah. How do you do that? The simplest way is in Python is to use the at command. You see this little at over here? There's a ton of ways to do matrix vector multiplication. All are complicated. This one is the simplest. Simply take this matrix A inverse at B, it does A inverse times B. Now, A inverse times B is equal to the solution vector. Okay? So, how do we build the coefficient matrix and right-hand side vector? We've noticed that many of you have been relying so much on the pandas library. And I love that. I like that. But for the most part, for the things we're doing, pandas is like using a bulldozer to hammer a nail. You know? 
it's a, your objective is to solve the problem in the simplest, easiest, understandable term. Okay? I don't mind you're using pandas. Okay, that's fine. Use pandas, but I think it's so overly complicated to the things we're doing here. So, you can't create arrays with pandas and NumPy arrays, and good luck, because once you create a matrix in a NumPy matrix, you're going to lose your understanding of rows and columns, because it inverts the meaning of those. So, follow these simple strategies, because for the most part, 99% of the cases, you're not going to need anything else. Okay? Okay, here's how you do it. We simply use, to create a matrix, or a column vector, or a row vector, you just simply use lists, these bracketed containers. So a list is automatically treated as a vector, and you don't have to worry if it's a row vector or a column vector. Python knows better than we do, okay? So for example, for the right-hand side vector over here, I just create a list, 50, 0, 0. See the commas in, be in between? For the matrix, I create a nested list of lists. So I open an outer list, and then I create a list for the first row, 3 minus 1.50. I close it. I put a comma. I put another list below it, which contains the second row, 0, 4.5 minus 1.3. And finally, the last row, minus 3, 0, and 3.3. .3. Notice the brackets, okay, and the nesting. That's it. You don't overcomplicate it. Can you use NumPy matrices and pandas matrices and whatever? Of course, but good luck figuring out what they're doing. This is simple, useful, and helpful. Even for the heat transfer problem we're going to do, this is going to be more than sufficient. It does the job, guys, okay? All right. Are we ready to do some Python activities? All right, go to your modules on Canvas and download LinSolve Activity 1, Conservation of Mass. Download this notebook. Now, the first feedback I got today was, um, turns out that some are enjoying more that I do the programming with you. And we're, we're going to continue doing that. However, these notebooks are now notebooks with gaps. But I give you most of the code and then put question marks where you need to fill in. So it's a win-win situation because I want you to try. I want you to try. I will not be helping you if I show you by hand. Okay? I will want you to try. So these notebooks from now on, they contain gaps. They contain most of the code with some question marks. Okay? So go ahead and download this notebook. Open it up in your Jupyter. Um, I'll do the same. And we're going to solve this system of equations to get an answer. It's in the modules section um, under linear solvers. I have a question. So like, when you print B is this, right? Is that vertical or that's a horizontal? It doesn't matter. It's just a, it's just a list. It knows how to negotiate it internally, OK? Because when you feed it to a, a, a numpy.solve, linalgebra.solve, it's going to automatically assume it's a column vector, okay. right? So. Yeah, don't worry. So, nothing to worry about. All right. All right, so you should have a notebook with question marks in it, right? You should see a notebook with a bunch of question marks.
Okay, so I'm doing the same here. I'm do downloading this notebook right now. All right. So I think these notebooks are the notebooks with gaps um, are a little bit more useful. So they're like in between me programming in front of you and you giving a, uh, an attempt. <laughs> okay. So again, do a nested, a nested list or a list of lists for the array, for the coefficient matrix. Yeah, so you got to put um, another list for the second row and another list for the third row, right? So there's the outer list with those outer brackets, oh, okay. but then one list and another list and another list, right? So yes. Uh -huh. brackets is what mm -hmm. you're saying? Okay, yeah, gotcha. yeah. And then a comma after the second one, right? Because each row is now its own vector, right? Yeah. Emily? Okay. Like this, though? Yes. Perfect. Okay. You got your notebook sorted out? Okay. If it wasn't working, just use the CHPC one. <laughs> you just have to restart it? Yeah. Okay. Good. It's cold in, on this side. <laughs> like all, all bundled up over here. <laughs> Gotta get you like a space heater. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Me yeah. and Ben uh -huh. are getting different results for okay. kind of the same script. What, uh, what, oh, what do you know? Uh, okay. So, can you um, make it a little bit brighter, uh, yeah. if you don't mind? Three oh, you know, and fifty. Run you didn't run it. Um, let's try again. Yeah. This is. Uh, 3 minus 1.5, 0, 0, 4.5 minus 1.3. Oh, there it is. You need a 3.3, not yeah. 1.3. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There you go. There we go. Well, um, no. Oh, oh, I had the wrong thing. <laughs> no, yeah, because this is wrong, right? You can't have a negative concentration, right? So actually, I'm gonna illustrate that right now. That's a good. That's a good example of uh, trying to catch like an error, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, yeah. So your b vector is wrong, right? It's just one vector, right? Not a nested vector. So just open the bracket 50, 0, 0, right? Yeah, 50. Does it automatically? Yeah, it will. Uh, yep, exactly. Okay. Yep, you don't have to worry about that. Yep, 50, 0, 0. You all got it? You're getting it? Okay. It's a different size matrices. Yeah, well, you did the B vector wrong. Okay. Why did you have two nested lists, right? It's just one list. So remove the outer bracket. From B? From B, yeah. Right? It's just one vector. There you go. Yeah. All right. You got an answer? Yeah. Can we only do the like, decimal points on some of those? Like, why wouldn't that be 3.0? Well, I wrote this mathematically, right? not numerically put 3.0 but in the equation i put there i use just exact math right it's like in a math textbook i'm not showing a numerical yeah but you put it here as a float in your code you put it as a float right but i'm not going to put 3.0 in a math equation because it's a math equation it's an exact math equation not a numerical math equation okay it's just a nomenclature thing, but you put 3.0 in there, yeah. 
Now, if any of the entries has a, has a decimal point, you're good. It's going to figure out that it's all um, floating point. Okay? Okay. Did anyone... Okay. One more question. No, B at inverse, not times. A and not B times A inverse. That's wrong. I, I uh, okay, yeah, you, yeah, it's not gonna, yeah, it will spit out something, but it's not correct. Yep, at B. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a d matrix vector multiplication. Yeah, it does the standard matrix because there are other multiplications defined in Python. What if you want to multiply element by element, right? What if you just want to do one? Uh, all of those are defined in Python. So the at is the standard vector multiplication. Mm -hmm. It's also the same. Yep, it will do the same. Yep, of course. Okay. Did anyone get a negative value in the answer? Did anyone get a negative value? Okay. What does that tell us? Why do you know? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if you did it right or wrong. Okay. Does the negative value raise any red flags for you? Okay. So let's think about it. These are, what are we solving for? Yeah, which are the concentrations, which is mass per unit volume. So in negative value, you would indicate you have negative mass per unit volume, which tells you there's something wrong in your solution. Okay? Now what that means, so we had that a couple of other um, spots, and I'm glad that that occurred because that's a great example of not just blindly trusting values from a computer, okay? It probably means there's something, uh, an error in your either equations, so that's a modeling error, or a human error in your coefficient matrix. Okay? So double check that. Oh, come up and see. You found it? Was it 1.3 or 3.3? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right. Like, do you really need to do it now in front of you? You are all, all Python masters now. All right. <laughs> all right, so let's do this. It's going to be a nested. Each row is going to be a list, OK? 3 minus 1.5 and 0, OK? And then 0, 4.5 minus 1.3, another vector. And then the last one, minus 3, 0, 0.0. .0 and 3.3, okay? So treat this as it is. This is the brackets of the matrix, first row, second row, third row. Now, for the B vector, it is a column vector, so when you write it as a, horiz as a horizontal vector, it might appear that it is a row vector. But the great thing about this approach is that you don't have to worry about that at all. Just write it as it is, and Python will know that you're passing this to a solve function. It's going to figure out, like, yeah, you know, they probably mean a column vector. I'm not going to, you know, uh, puff about it. So I'm, just, I'm not going to fuss about it, right? So let's just do that. 50, okay, 0, and then 0. And finally, mp.linalgebra.solve. Oh, got an error. Okay, let's see. All right, 19.2, 5.04, and 17.4 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, those are the concentrations, right? If you want to use the inverse method, A inverse is simply inverse A, and then result is A inverse at B. There are... Python is, the great thing about Python and the worst thing is that it's very permissive. You can multiply oranges and lemons and add potatoes, you know, and dance with all of that. I don't know. It allows you to do all of that. So it's a blessing and a curse, right? So be careful with what you do and 
always reason with your answers. Okay? If you, have some, if you suspect something is off with the answer, then question it. Okay? Using the at is a great way to do matrix vector multiplication. And also Python is going to figure out what you mean here. That this is a 3 by 3 matrix. And this guy is a 3 by 1 vector. So I'm going to get a 3 by 1 answer. Okay? And three answers, three values this is what you got. They should be identical. Okay? Great. All right. And really, that's it. That's all you need to know about solving systems of linear equations, those two methods. Okay, you can go home and sit. No, I'm, ch I'm joking. There's a lot more to talk about, okay? But pretty much this is it. For the vast majority of problems you're going to be dealing with, even in your career, unless you enter the world of simulation science, you're going to be dealing with small systems of equations. If you end up doing machine learning and artificial intelligence work, you're probably going to be dealing with larger systems of equations. So there are other methods that are more efficient than these two methods. I will prove to you that these methods that we learned today are not efficient at all for large systems. But first, we're going to now generalize. Now we know how to drive, OK? Let's open up the hood and discuss some theory. A general system of equations with unknowns xi, x1, x2, x3, x4, all the way to xn, okay, and unknowns. Those could be temperature, those could be pressure, those could be some variable, phi, or velocities. So don't get lost if your homework or your exam puts in variables that are not called x or y. Don't be confused if the coefficients are called x, but the unknowns are called t, okay? All you have to think about is, what are my unknowns? What are my coefficients, right? A general system of equations looks like this. And there's a numbering procedure with the coefficients. Like, what's up with that? A11, A12, A21, A22, etc. Well, because you're tracking equation number and variable number. So the first index in the coefficient tells you what equation you correspond to. So A1 is the first equation. A2 is the second equation. AM is the mth equation. And the second index corresponds to which variable? So A11 is first equation, first variable. A22 is second equation, second variable. A2n is second equation, nth variable. Okay? There's a reasoning. But it's easier when you write it in matrix form. Because now in matrix form, oh, yeah, you can just kind of make sense. You can see the rows and columns, right? And you can see the need for two indices. Okay? So you should be very familiar. You should get familiar and be very familiar with how you convert a system of algeb algebraic equations into matrix form. Okay? Now there are many who will show you this scary formula. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I hate that formula. I hate that formula. What this is saying simply is that each equation is a dot product between the, the row and the un solution, the unknown vector equal to the right hand side. So B1 is equal to A11 x1 plus A12 x2 plus A13 x3 and so on, right? So it's this summation. Okay? But you're not going to worry about that because you're going to write the matrix and do lines and do the dot products visually, okay? Now, how do you remember? where you are in a matrix. And to this day, ye after years of dealing with matrices, I can never get it in my head that AIJI is, which one is the row, which one is the column? Column, I always forget. So I have my own nomenclature. I call it ARC, A row column. Okay, arc. When you're looking at a matrix, think of the word arc. ARC, the entries in a matrix are ARC, arc. A row column. The first index is the row to which this element belongs, and the second index is the column. You might find that useful, you might not, okay? But I find it really useful. So if I give you A47, arc, row number four, column number seven, okay? Now the question. The system of equations I wrote above the matrix, we have n unknowns, but the matrix is an m by n matrix. Okay? So for this to be well posed, what is the relation between m and n? So you have n unknowns, but m equations. 
So if you have two, two unknowns, how many equations do you need? Two. You have three unknowns, how many equations do you need? You have n unknowns, how many equations do you need? n, exactly. So for this to be well posed, m and n need to be equal. In other words, the matrix needs to be a square matrix. Because you can have systems of equations that are ill-posed. Either over-determined, you have more equations than unknowns, or underdetermined, you have less equations than there are unknowns. Okay? For it to be well posed, you need to have as many equations as there are unknowns. In other words, the matrix needs to be a square matrix. You can't even solve the problem unless you have a square matrix or an equal number of equations as there are unknowns. As you are deriving your governing equations for a problem, always think about that. What are my unknowns? C1, C2, C3. How many equations do I need? Three. If I get seven equations, eh, maybe some of them are redundant. So you get rid of those that are redundant, okay? Matrices come in many flavors, okay? Now this is where it gets really interesting and fun. There's a general dense matrix where pretty much all the coefficients of all the unknowns are non-zero. Most of them, they're non-zero. We call that a generally dense matrix. In fact, if 50% or more of the elements are non-zero in a matrix, we call that a dense matrix. If less than 50% are non-zero, then we call that a sparse matrix. We'll touch on that a little later. There's the upper triangular matrix where the main diagonal and all upper diagonal terms are non-zero. Everything below the main diagonal is zero. You see there's, I didn't put zeros because it takes a lot of work to put zeros in there. There's the lower triangular system of equations. There's a diagonal matrix where only the main diagonal contains non-zero coefficients. There's the identity matrix, which is a primary diagonal matrix with all ones on the diagonal. And then there are banded matrices. Banded matrices are very common in heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and diffusion problems, where you have bands of non-zero, not like bands, you know, but bands or like diagonals that are non-zero, and then a lot of zeros, and then other diagonals, and a lot of zeros, and then a lot of diagonals. We call those banded matrices, okay? All right, so what now, right? We know how to solve systems of equations. In many cases, for the most part, that's it. Take this and conquer the world. Solve or A inverse. Even for the rest of the course, that's what we're going to need. Once we hit regression, interpolation, curve fitting, differentiation, all we need to do are solve or A inverse. I'm not asking for anything else. However, I need to tell you that there are many cases in engineering where, again, I keep repeating the same thing because I kind of want it to stick in your head, that solve an A inverse is not efficient and it is very, very expensive. Okay? So what I'm going to do here is actually show you that this is the case. So we are going to consider a example in heat transfer, okay? Consider this rod could be a section of this wall or you put you forgot your spatula in the you know your in your stew you're cooking something it's heated on one side and it's exposed to the air on the other side and there's like a fire under it or like you're grilling something outdoor you know and you put your hand oh my gosh it's so hot right so this is the same example there's heating on either side of the rod or the piece of material okay there's heating on either side so we're going to fix the temperature on the left side and fix the temperature on the right side, okay? And then we're gonna put heat. It took me a lot of time to do this animation, but we're gonna put heat somewhere along the rod, in the middle, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, okay? So clearly, as you are heating this rod, the temperature is gonna rise, right? And it's either, it's probably gonna dissipate if these temperatures are lower than the strength of the heating source, it's going to be hottest in the middle and then kind of slowly cool off to the end, right? So you're going to see a peak in the temperature profile and then goes down to T0 or TR, whatever those temperatures are. The equation that governs this process in one dimension is a second-order diffusion equation. 
You might have seen that in your ODEs. You're going to see it here, but with a physics context. Contest, context. And I promise you we're going to solve this. We're going to learn how to solve this numerically by the end of the course. Okay? You'll know how to take this equation, turn it into algebraic equations, and solve it. Okay? But today I want you to take what I'm saying for granted. I hope that you have enough trust in what I'm saying so far that what I'm telling you is true. Okay? This is the governing equation. Okay? And depending on the source term, there's, there's no solution for this in general. In some cases, there are solutions very complicated. Okay? We're doing numerical methods here. Okay? We're not doing analytical methods. So how do we solve this numerically? Remember what I said about the problem at the beginning of the fire? What we're going to do later, we're going to say, okay, we need to find the temperature along the rod. So we're going to place numerical points or numerical probes. We're going to assign a temperature, an unknown temperature value at each point. We're going to call them T0, T1, T2, T3, all the way to Tn minus 1, n points. You could do 100 points, you could do 1,000, you could do a million points. Clearly, the more points you add, you're going to get a little bit more accurate, right? Because you're capturing more and more of that change in the temperature along the rod. Agreed? Then you do some magic. And I promise you, you will learn how to do that magic. But right now, all I want you to know is that this procedure results in simply a system of equations, a system of algebraic equations that relates T1 to T0 and T2 and relates T2 to T1 and T3 T3 to T2 and T4 and so on. So you get a banded matrix, very simple coefficients, ones on the lower diagonal, minus twos almost everywhere on the main diagonal, and ones on the upper diagonal. These are the coefficients. These are the unknowns, right? We're solving for the temperature, T0, T1, T2, et cetera, et cetera. You, you'll learn how to do this, but I want to show you the point of linear solvers first, how expensive they can be. And something on the right-hand side. This is perhaps going to be the more complex thing to, to implement. But don't worry about that. Again, this is an illustration. Okay. Now, I hope you can trust that this is the system of equations that approximates that equation. Okay? You've got to trust me on that. So next, what I want you to do, yes? Why do you put an n minus 1 instead of just that? Then it will be n plus 1 points. Or you can count them from t1. It's just a nomenclature. I counted them however many points you want, okay? You can put in just a number. But I, I count them from T0 to Tn minus 1 so that I have n points because I don't want to count from T1 to Tn because my indexing is based on 0, and so it just it'll, makes a little bit more sense. But it doesn't matter, yeah. Just call it from 1 to n, it doesn't, from 0 to n, it doesn't matter. Okay, so what we're going to do, I implemented all of this for you, okay, in Python. You're going to download that notebook now before I show you where the notebook is. You're going to download it, and you're just going to change the number of points. You go and put solve this problem for 5 points or 10 points or 50 points and keep pushing and see what happens to the linear solver. Okay? Let's do it. What did, did you put like 100,000 points? <laughs> yeah, it crashed. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't do it. How many did you put? <laughs> five, five Googleplex points. <laughs> All right, so download this one, okay? Let me download it too, so we can see the same thing that you all are looking at. Go to the modules. The linear solvers module, it's called direct solvers are expensive. Okay. So hopefully this is what you're seeing. The title is called direct solvers are expensive. Because the solvers that we learned about right now are called direct solvers. We'll understand what that means in a minute. But that's where the title comes from. Okay? The objective of this 
exercise is just to show you that direct solvers can be expensive. All you have to do is just execute this first cell. Come here, this is your user input. This is the only thing you're gonna change. Let's start with 20 points. And then here, you read this, do not modify below this line. It's all capital, okay? You know, I, if I could even put my picture in like ASCII art over there, I would put it like, do not touch that line, those lines below, okay? All right, so 20 points. And now, what I'm calling here, I'm solving for the temperature. So all of this code over here is gonna build a matrix with 20 points along the rod, okay? And here I'm solving this matrix with the right-hand side, and I'm storing it in a solution vector called T for temperature. And then I'm timing it. If you remember TikTok in MATLAB, it starts a timer over here and stops it over there. We take the difference, we can measure how much time we've spent in solving the system of equations, okay? So I'm gonna run it here. It took 0 0.005 seconds to solve the system with 20 equations. Now come to the one at the bottom and you plot it, okay? Yellow is hot, like almost 700 degrees. So my heating source is just kinda around one third um, from the right, okay? And then the temperature drops to T left and T right, which are set at 300 or so, okay? Okay, so now let's do more points. Let's do, pick a number, 300, okay, 300. It took 0 0.02 seconds, so we went from 0 0.0005 to 0 0.02 seconds, that's two order of magnitude, like two factor of 200. So it's 200 times more expensive going from 20 to 300. So going, increasing the number of equations or the number of points by one order of magnitude caused the cost to go by two orders of magnitude. So there's a nonlinear relation between those two, okay? Now you plot this, it's gonna look nicer, right? Because you have, <laughs> You have more points. Agreed? All right, let's do it more. Let's see how many more points. 10,000. 10, 10, 10, 10, okay, 10,000. 10, how about we do 1,000? I don't want it to embarrass me and crash because I know it's going to crash. Okay, so now it went to 0 0.04. Okay, we're still kind of, okay, so let's do 10,000. All right, I'll see you later. <laughs> it took 12 seconds. Okay. Well, it took me five seconds. You have a better computer. I know, I know. What can I say? <laughs> five seconds, but that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Now, think of this process as being only a small part of the fire simulation that they did. The wind barely got into the door, they solved the heat transfer. Then the wind moved a little bit, then they solved the heat transfer. Then moved a little bit, solved the heat transfer. Imagine if for the calculation of the heat transfer, you need to spend five seconds every time and you're running the simulation for 10 million steps. And that's for every point in the room too, right? No, that's for all the points in the room. Well, yeah, so the whole, yeah. Every point in the room. Well, we, not for every point, for time. So we're moving in time. So this heat transfer problem is typically solved repeatedly over time. We start with time t0 and then we increment a little bit, 0 0.1 seconds, 0 0.2 seconds, and so on, okay? All right, now let's push it further. Let's do um, 20,000. We're gonna, we're gonna kill it, 100,000. So we were five seconds now with 20,000, we just doubled the number of points. It's still thinking. Probably gonna be 15, 20 seconds, 15 seconds. It's a lot, it's a long time. It's a long time. And 10,000 points is nothing, is literally nothing. For this 1D problem, it's an overkill for sure. I mean, we have, look at how accurate this is. It's very nice and smooth, very nice distribution, but this is very expensive. Probably is gonna just stop and not do anything. If you've tried, Okay, 40 seconds, 40 th seconds. The next one, 50,000 or 100,000 is gonna crash. 
This is going to run out of memory. It's not going to be able to do it. That's bad. Okay. So the point of this exercise is to just show you that these linear solvers, despite their convenience, they are only to be used for small systems of equations on the order of 10, 20 equations, okay? Not more, okay? Luckily, there are more efficient methods for large systems of equations, okay? Let's see. Okay. All right. So what I've done here, I've plotted the timing, the time to solution using the inverse method or the standard solver, so using A inverse or using solve, time on the y-axis and number of equations on the x-axis. So initially you have a lot of fuzz, right, because you're like touching between round off error, et cetera, in, in the timing. But then so once you get to um, a thousand equations and more, look at the rise in cost. Now compare that to that. So the red and blue lines are actually exponential, okay? So they're going to grow exponentially. The black line is an algorithm that we're going to learn to use that works for systems for heat transfer and diffusion and mass transfer. It's called the tridiagonal matrix algorithm, and it's a linear cost. You double the equations, you're just going to double the time or whatever slope that is, okay? But look at that. For 10,000 equations, the Tomas algorithm took about 10 to the minus 3 seconds, whereas the standard method took about 1 second. Okay, four or four or three orders of magnitude, 300 times faster than the standard method. Okay, now what happens when you go to two dimensions? Or three dimensions, three dimensions is even worse. In two dimensions, your matrices become more complex because you're not only relating to the, the temperature to the points to the left and your right, you're relating it to the points above and below, right? Because you are in two dimensions. You have a heated plate, for example, right? Your stove, right? It's, there's temperature, there's heat all over around it. So what happens in 2D? Again, I'm plotting the solver time versus the number of points in each direction. And in 2D, 100 points in each direction is nothing. That's like we have to, that's like not acceptable in research even you run a calculation with 100 points in each direction. The blue line shows you the standard method that we're using. It's exponential. You can't, you can't do it. It's useless. Okay? It's useless. But there are other methods. Look at that. Look at this one in red. This is what's called an algebraic multi-grid solver. It's a very fancy, complicated solver. It's like a thousand lines of code just to do that solver. Um, but look at that. It's so cheap, it remains almost flat at half a second for this problem, okay? In our code, we use what's called a, a preconditioned full multi-grid um, conjugate gradient solver. <laughs> Krylov space preconditioned full multi-grid conjugate gradient solver. Okay, that's what we use in our code. And we still complain about it because we think it's slow. It still consumes, in the COVID study, if we were to put a dollar amount on the cost of computing, so the Center for High Performance Computing, it costs money to run on the cluster because they need to maintain it, they need to pay personnel, they need to cool it. You go in there, it's like, uh, you guys in the back should go in there, it's very warm, <laughs> but they need to cool it, okay? There's like, it's very cold in the back over there. So it's like a space heater in there because of all the computers. So if we were to put a dollar amount on the cost just to solve the linear systems for our COVID study, it costs us $63,000. $63,000 just to solve for the linear systems and the problems we're dealing with. Okay? So these are real things. But for the cases for small systems, so solve an A inverse are wonderful, okay? All right, I'll talk in general about the two solution methods, which I kind of alluded to. So in general, there are two methods to attack these kinds of problems. The direct methods, which is what you learn in math and what we just learned, 
np.linalgebra.solve or um, A inverse. These are direct methods because they solve the system exactly. There's no errors involved, no truncation, no nothing, except round off if you're doing it on a computer. If you're doing it by hand or with integer arithmetic, there's no errors. It solves it exactly. And that's why they're so costly, because it's trying to solve it exactly. But there is another class of much more efficient, cheaper, and effective solvers that are called iterative methods. Those solvers do not at claim to solve the system exactly. All they care about is give you an approximation to the inverse or an approximation to the solution. Because the idea is like, well, we started with the modeling and our models contain errors anyway. Our approximation to the model, so converting the differential equation to an algebraic equation, there are truncation errors over there anyway. Why do we have to solve those exactly? We might as well get away with some error and solve it much more effectively and much more cheaply. And those are called iterative methods. Okay? Gaussian elimination is an example of uh, a direct method. LU factorization, you've heard of those. And the one we're going to learn here to, in this class, the TDMA, um, the tridiagonal matrix algorithm, or the Tomas algorithm, it's a direct method. So it's going to solve the system exactly, but it only works for matrices that have only three diagonals. And guess what? Heat transfer problems like the one we did and similar problems, they have three diagonals in them. And so it's very useful. Okay, we're going to learn that. There are fast Fourier, fast Fourier uh, methods, and um, we will do the tridiagonal algorithm um, next week. All right? Thank you for your attention, and uh, good luck. I'll see you on uh, Tuesday.